Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Marcellus's webinar on our Global Compounders portfolio. Thank you very much for joining in. Today we have from our Global Compounders team, Arindam Mandal and J.B. Sethi. Uh, and the subject uh, of today's discussion, very interesting one, is uh, capital uh, allocation. Uh, we have spoken you know, at Marcellus a uh, number of times on, on, on this subject, uh, but it remains uh, you know, always as important to kind of keep talking about it uh, or to reinforcing the concepts again and again. Uh, and today, interestingly, we'll do that in the context of our uh, GCP portfolio. Uh, so Arindam, uh, Jaibir, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, you know, I, I read the, the GCP newsletter and, uh, you know, like everyone at Marcellus, uh, you know, cricket is our uh, one of our favorite sports. Uh, and there was an analogy on uh, MS Dhoni and with capital allocation, so that was quite interesting. So, you know, how about we start with that, and if you can elaborate on on what you mean by that? Yeah, uh, sure, Salil. Um, yeah, I thought, I mean, uh, you know, capital allocation is such an abstract topic. I I couldn't think about a better analogy. So, uh, I mean, you know, the Dhoni, the captain of Indian team, right? Uh, the Indian national cricket team. We all know him. What I found even more interesting is his stint with CSK, Chennai Super Kings. So if you recall in 2008, uh, you know, if every most of the teams were actually assigned one icon player back then. So Dhoni was one who was auctioned and Chennai Super Kings bought them. And uh, it was never an infinite money pool, right? So it was always, the pool of the money was always constrained, which was the nice thing about IPL, right? So it is not that. Uh, some franchise having a deep pocket, they can buy the buy all of the best players. So it was naturally constrained, so that that created a level playing field. Now, see what Dhoni did with that, right? Um, Fifteen years later, they participated in. Uh, Sixteen years later, participated I think in fourteen of those. Five time champions, ten times finalist, twelve time playoffs, right? And um, I couldn't really think about a better example. Like you have this limitation on resources, you have to operate within those. At the same time, you have to create the best value. And in cricket, the basics are very simple, right? It is just about batting, bowling, and fielding. So you have these three pillars. And how do you optimize your resources around that and get the best value out of those? That is exactly what he did. And that was, that was the result, you know, like what you see, what CSK achieved through the years. Now, um, if I translate that to a corporate perspective, right? Um, <clears throat> if you think about it, um, at the core, your business is generating some cash flow, what you call operating cash flow in finance, right? And how do you allocate that cash flow into four buckets? The four buckets are basically investing for organic growth, which you call capital expenditure. Or you can, if you think that your debt levels are kind of unsustainable, you can pay back that debt. Or you can look for, you know, some other way to uh, create value for shareholders. One way is to do buyback. Buyback is not that common in uh, India, but broadly, globally, it is actually a fairly common uh, way to create shareholder value. And the second thing, the second thing is actually uh, MA. Right. So these are the four avenues that that one can explore when when they think about allocating that operating cash flow to different avenues to get uh, you know based off shareholder value. Now, uh, what is interesting is that you know in India probably we are still a high growth country. We we don't see you know that being often spoke, spoken about, like you invest mostly in organic growth. So you do a lot of capex and that kind of generates the shareholder value compounding. That is your main key, the key uh, way to create value. But when you're looking at, you know, globally, many of the industries are actually, you know, slower growth per se, right? So to extract the most value out of it, capital allocation becomes even more important and capital allocation not in the traditional sense, but more on the kind of, you know, external capital allocation, if I can put it that way, right? So uh, in that context, um, you know, we just try to think about like the companies that we have in GCP, they are not, most of them doesn't have too much of debt. So basically we kind of wanted to put it together here. Uh, you know, basically 
we took out the date component. We talked about four. So we have for our companies, it is mostly three. So you have this predictable cash flows, and then you can either do these three things, right? And you can create long-term compounding returns. Uh, now, this is a chart. Uh, again, it's a little bit tougher to read, but broadly, I'd say to think about it this way. Um, if you are doing a simple DCF, right? When you're thinking about what you have input here is, a company is growing their free cash flow at 10% kicker. So suppose they do it for 15 years and your discount rate is say 9%. You, you kind of, you know, discounted it back towards present value. You get a value X, right? Now think of a company which have already invested in their organic CapEx, whatever they could do. The remaining is basically the free cash flow. Now what they do with that the basic underlying assumption is that they are returning that back to the shareholders, right? So that the shareholders can utilize, they can reinvest that money into the share market that can give them a cost of capital return. But what if they don't, right? If they don't, it basically sits on their uh, balance sheet, does nothing, gets a three, four percent return, basically what you get in money market. And that actually destroys the value of the enterprise by you know, a significant amount. I mean, for here, we have shown that minus 22% number here that you see, there's an example, right? And similarly, we assume that, you know, the entire cash flow is being returned to the shareholders. That might not be true. I mean, if it's a good capital allocator, and we'll be talking a few of those today that are part of the GCP portfolio, they can actually, instead of returning that to the, you know, the end users, like the, the shareholders, they can actually invest it back in a much more, you know, uh, accretive way, right? So where here you took an example of 12% instead of the market return. You can see, I mean, right, so the DCF always kind of, you know, tries to under report uh, or under appreciate the good capital allocators, whereas they kind of over appreciate the not so good capital allocators, right? Uh, yeah, so right. Yeah. So if, if Tony were to start uh, PMS, then it'd be tough competition, I assume that's the case. Uh, right? That is <laughs> absolutely true. He's, he's, I think, is <laughs> underappreciated <laughs> capital allocator for sure. Yes. Talent. Great, yeah. Great. Right. So, so uh, you know, we see some really interesting names uh, on this. Some I have heard of, uh, some I have no idea, uh, you know, what they do. So it's really interesting. Uh, now, would you like to maybe start with the first name on the list, uh, Danaher? Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, so Danaher, I mean, I have uh, written here, Acquire, Rinse, Divest. I mean, this is probably one company. I mean, it's uh, it is a significant weight in, uh, in our uh, GCP portfolio. Uh, it is probably a poster boy of good capital allocation. Um, so, I mean, I first came to know this company or came to hear about this company uh, almost 10, 11 years back. Um, uh, so one of my, you know, classmates actually in, in my master's, during my master's, he used to work at Danaher. And um, when he, he you know, came to know that, you know, you, uh, I want to be in asset management. So he asked me like, have you heard of this company? It's an industrial company called Danaher Corporation. I, was, I said that, you know, not that much. And his his response was very simple. You go back in since 1995 or 1996, in last 18 years, you take any two-year rolling window and Dana has never underperformed s &P. And okay, so that was that was kind of eye-opener. So, you know, when you think about industrial companies, it's always your G's or Honeywell's or the 3Ms of the world that comes into your mind. But this was Dana. Now, um, eventually as luck, would take you uh, when I started doing industrials, I got a chance to you know cover this company and own it actually for many of our portfolios. Um, so just to give you a brief history, I mean, history is very interesting here. So two brothers, uh, you know, Steve, Stephen Rail and Michelle Rail, they basically uh, in 90, early 1980s, uh, they acquired a bankrupt REIT or Real Estate Investment Trust, which had a lot of loss carry forwards, you know, in their balance sheet. And what they did is they took that advantage and kind of took all their profits that they were making in other businesses to channelize to that REIT. And they listed that company in the public market. And that 80s were actually that junk bond rally that was going on in the US. 
So they took advantage of that from 84 to 90, that time frame. They bought around 12 companies in that period of time. And it was a classic P acquisition, you know, like you buy the company, those are not run well. And then you try to take out the flesh and you, you keep what is necessary for you and you actually make money out of it because money was getting cheaper at that point of time. Uh, towards the end of 1990 or early 1990, uh, if you can recall, uh, of course, there was a flash crash in 1987, but in 1990, uh, the Gulf War, the market was not that great. And at that point of time, still, the Rails brothers, they understood that, you know, they can't run it as a hold co. So they needed some operator, right? At that point of time, they uh, they got someone called George Sherman in 1990, who was kind of very good operator. He had knowledge of doing these things. So he came in and he basically put a system around this around this entire structure, right? So it was kind of a set of companies operating this jointly, but he kind of put a structure. And uh, luckily, uh, not so luckily, but uh, in 1986, they actually acquired a company called uh, Chicago Pneumatic, through which they got an employee. His name was also George. He was actually an expert in Toyota manufacturing system, the Kaizen. That you, that you know, right? And he understood the opportunity to implement Kaizen in many of these industrial companies who are kind of operating very inefficiently, right? So that was a kind of new era. Uh, so they started to, you know, put a system around it. And George Sherman also understood that, you know, um, we were buying these cheap assets like industrial pipes, you know, this kind of uh, plastics, you know, tire chucks, etc. But to be in the market for a longer time, you need to buy good assets. So they started making investment into buying some really good assets like Fluke, which is, you know, um, I'm not sure if there are engineering students here. We have used this kind of uh, measurement instruments during our uh, during our college days. So they are basically were going up in the value chain, right? So uh, that was George Sherman era. So he basically did two things, as I said, taking the, bettering the company profile and putting a system around it. Then came Larry Culp in 2001. So Larry Culp was a Harvard graduate. He became a CEO of pretty early age. He became a CEO at the age of 38. You know, that's kind of, as you can imagine, very, very early. And um, after he took over, he understood uh, two things, you know, uh, that, yes, we are keeping on acquiring these companies, which is great. But at the same time, to keep the machine rolling, we need to make the business less cyclical, right? Because if you want to borrow more, then you have to have a predictable cash flow. And as part of that, uh, he started buying less cyclical business, not super high growth, but businesses that are growing at four to five percent, not more than that. But they're very niche leaders in each of those sectors, in each of their verticals that they are operating in. So, uh, and along with that. Um, you know, what additional thing it did, not only less cyclical business, but also the businesses which has high consumables. So when I say consumables, that means uh, think of a razor blade model, right? So you buy the razor, the consumable is your blade. So you, you know, you buy the razor one time, but you have to keep on buying the uh, blades many, many times. So Danaher focused, started to focus on this consumable part of the business and you know, ironically, medical devices or life science as a business is kind of rife for that, that kind of end market, right? I mean, you find a lot of instruments that need to be, that are needed to be replaced very frequently. So Dan has started to allocate more and more capital in building those verticals. Okay. Um, now, remember like what George Sherman started that operational part of the business. So that was in full force during the Larry Culp time frame. Right. So uh, that became so good. I mean, Danaher's continuous improvement business system, it is actually manical at times. That's what people say. Now, what it does is uh, it makes your business more efficient. Right. So, for example, if Danaher buys a business uh, at, say, 15 percent margin, because of their operational excellences, they can take the margin to 25 or 30 percent in three to five years. Now, what that means is that when they're looking for an asset, which is good asset, but they can actually bid higher compared to 
their next competitor because they know how to juice up the returns, right? So they can actually pay 50% more than the competitor is paying because they know that the operating margin profile can be improved much more than anyone else can do, right? So this continued till 2014, actually that, that's when I started actively covering Danaher and Larry Kalb retired in 2014, but the, his retirement actually didn't bring any change to the company. The company continued to operate. It was as it used to be operating. And towards 2016, uh, they did another important thing. They kind of stri stripped out their lower growth industrial business and they just kept their life science business. Right. So uh, now if you think about it, uh, just going back again, 30 years, they had a business that was growing lower than GDP to some extent or almost approximately similar to GDP. That was in mid 80s. Towards end of 90, they had a business that was growing at par with GDP. In mid 2010s, they are actually growing above GDP. Right. So they basically throughout their acquisitions and divestment, they kept it, uh, you know, it kept uh, the kept they kind of made the business better and better right and uh right now i mean if you think about it uh this year they are going to uh divest their slower growth environmental business which is 20 percent of their business right now and post that what then i would be it would be like a eight to nine percent top line grower with all their margin efficiencies they get to 11 12 percent and on top of that you know, you get another two to three percent just from capital allocation. So that 14, 15 percent kind of machine, if you look at this chart, right? Uh, through any time frame, I mean, you can see in the in the chart, I mean, five, 10, 15, that 15 to 18 percent compounding machine that just keeps on producing return for the shareholders. And I would say one thing that is very exceptional for Danner that very few can do is improving the organic growth profile. So they understood that, you know, at some point of time, they will be hitting the limits in terms of what they can acquire, how much they can acquire. So in the meantime, they just made sure that their organic business becomes so good that it's just, it can chuck that 15% kind of, you know, kegger that you're looking for over a long period of time, right? And what has been one, one observation, Salil, I would say is that uh, uh, for our viewers, uh, throughout most of it, trading period in history, Dana has barely traded above market multiple. Before 2016, it always, if you look at the price to forward cash flow, you know, free cash flow multiple, it has always been at power with market, slightly lower at times. Now it is relatively higher. I think it is 25% premium compared to where market is today. But that is a function of their organic growth improvement, not because of their good capital allocation. So market never really rewarded, you know, Danner for the good capital allocation. And we still think that is an opportunity for investors like us. Fantastic. Uh, you know, in fact, this 18% plus CFO per share growth for 30 a period, right? To 92 to, sorry, 92 to 20 a period. Yeah. And a 30 year compounding at 19.8%. Unbelievable. Uh, yeah. So I, I'm sure this story is yet to go on for a while. Uh, what else? You know, let tell us more about some exciting names like this. Yeah. So another one I had was um, Constellation Software. Um, it's actually a Canadian listed company. Again, um, um, my discovery really was of the stock was goes back to 2015, 2016. Um, so again, after Danaher, after studying Danaher, I was quite interested, you know, in this kind of companies which which have actually built a system around uh, acquisition, right? And that is the time I kind of came across uh, Constellation Software. So the background is also fairly interesting about Constellation. Um, so the founder, Mark Leonard, uh, after, after his MBA from University of Ontario, uh, he's a Canadian guy and the company is also listed in Canada. So he joined uh, a VC firm, okay? Uh, he joined a VC firm and he observed certain things and you know he thought that that can be arbitrage. So what he saw is that the VC firms are typically very obsessed with the total addressable market, right? Or what you call this day stamp. And they're also obsessed with uh, super high growth, right? If your company is not growing at 20, 25% per year, it really, really uh, doesn't make sense for many of the VC communities. But what he found is that 
there are many uh, good companies which are which might not be growing at that pace. There are companies which are growing at the five six percent kind of in that kegger, but they are actually profitable, and they are actually serving some niche, which is like a, it is not a big market. So there is limited risk that someone like someone big like some Microsoft would come and you know uh, poach that market. But at the same time, you get a very good predictable cash flow growth of say five six seven eight percent. And that is the market uh, he tried to address. That is what he tried to consolidate, basically. So he identified that this, this type of software are called vertical market software or VMS. Um, and this market is not small. I mean, if you think about uh, the entire software market, uh, you know, Jai will probably correct me, it is around 500 billion or close to 700 billion or close to a trillion. This market is kind of 15 to, you know, 15, 20% of that. That is why um, Constellation operates. Uh, what he understood is that uh, the real juice comes when he's buying smaller size of companies, right? So if you think about it, like a company which is offering a solution for, uh, you know, uh, egg and poultry procurement, and it is very particular to a region, for that matter, right? So the TAM is probably, you know, not more than 10 billion, 10 million, and the company has probably a 40, 50% market share. Now, if that is the case, Constellation can build it, Constellation can buy that at very cheap price, say sometimes one or two times price to sales multiple, and kind of rinse them. They have a very strict hurdle rate of, you know, 20% plus for smaller acquisition, 15 to 20% ROIC for larger acquisition. So, uh, Constellation identified that there is a long, long runway to do that. Now to execute that strategy, what you need is a bunch of great capital allocators. And that's what basically Mark Leonard created. So right now Constellation operates at, uh, I think with six operating groups. And within that six operating groups, they have 150 plus what they call business unit leaders. Actually, Mark Leonard rightly calls them uh, portfolio managers because they're actually port managing the portfolio. They don't really participate much in the operations of it. So they have def defined guardrails that what you can do, what you cannot do, right? Uh, the goal is to achieve the hurdle rates. So with that 150 plus BU leaders, it is kind of think about a sprawling root system of a tree, right? So you can think about the companies that are just uh, say one or two products. They have a root system, which is a singular two root system with very high depth, right? It's very difficult to uproot them. At the same time, Constellation kind of company, what Constellation tries to do as a sprawling root system, okay? Uh, but it is equally hard to uproot. And that's what Constellation built over time. So over, over last uh, 15, 16 years, uh, they have acquired close to 700 plus companies. Now they acquire actually 100 plus companies every year. But given that the system they have built, they keep the machine chugging along. In fact, uh, one chart that I should have put here is uh, the median uh, acquisition price that they have paid to acquire, and acquire a business, that has, that has not gone up meaningfully. I mean, I think their median acquisition price for an asset every year is close to three to $5 million. So that is the sweet spot. Now, if you think about, you know, the other private equity players, they might want to buy this kind of assets. But first of all, they do not have the kind of database that Constellation has. It is kind of, you know, like they have been doing it for years and years. So they know exactly how to reap the best out of these companies that they're buying, right? Constellation says that they have a database of uh, more than 40,000 companies for now, and that keeps on growing. So private equity companies don't have the ability to scale the business model, which Constellation could do, right? So that is the biggest mode of Constellation. And if you just look at these numbers, right? I mean, these numbers are actually quite striking. You just look at the free cash flow kegger, CFO per share kegger. They have been just compounding at around 18, 20% consistently. And their ROIC numbers are also have up 20%. Right, as I said, the business, the end market is probably, you know, $200 billion end market. They are probably less than 5% of that. So the runaway for this is huge. 
one of the challenges that people point out, the investors tend to point out is uh, that, you know, if you don't have too high organic growth, then at some point of time, you know, it is running on a treadmill, you kind of uh, fall, right? Now, Constellation understands that uh, they allocated a $200 million, you know, uh, fund to some kind of a VC investment where they can actually improve the organic growth profile. Having said that, I mean, uh, they, you know, we'll see how that goes, but point being, the runway for growth is still way longer. And what Mark Leonard has created is a system. And uh, what I like about this company is that, you know, they are a capital allocator first, and then they are operating in a vertical software market. So he keeps on telling that, you know, if he was running this business 100 years back, they probably would have been buying newspaper companies, not vertical management software companies. So the point being is that, when you're investing in a company like Constellation Software, you're basically handing over your money to someone who knows how to create, uh, you know, excess return. And that's what we like about this company. Amazing, right? Uh, 100, that means two acquisitions every week, right? That's some machine that these guys are running. Yeah. And 33% uh, compounding, I was just running some numbers, $100 invested uh, in Constellation 17 years ago would be worth some Twelve thousand seven hundred and fifty dollars now. Right, uh, it's really the mouth-watering uh, uh, returns. Uh, in the, I, I see another you know large position that uh, we have yeah. is in uh, yeah exactly trans time. So uh, this also looks extremely interesting. Yeah. Um, so actually, I love so I like this space, which is basically aerospace and defense. I mean, uh, so aerospace and defense, uh, you know, it is an industry. Um, you know, there's a natural regulatory moat that comes with it. For example, if you're flying any airline in the world, uh, even the seat belts has to be approved by FAA or any other governing body. So that if you if you somehow can get into that ecosystem, you typically don't want to get, you know, it's very hard to displace them. And a company like Transdime, uh, they understand that very well. So Transdime is basically an... Um, you know, we already talked about Haiko in many of our presentations, but Transdime and Haiko, they're basically the suppliers to the OEMs, like the Boeings and Airbus, right? Uh, so what Transdime does is, uh, you know, Transdime acquires proprietary sole source parts. What that means is that uh, if you are supposed, uh, and they are very cheap, like, you know, they have to acquire like so cheaply, uh, cheap value parts. Uh, and their sole source. What that means is that, for example, when Boeing is designing an aeroplane, they will ask for tenders across the globe. Like, you know, I need to make this seat belt, for example, uh, give me the best value. Now, Transdime tries to figure out which parts are going to be, you know, lowly priced, but at the same time, they'll be proprietary. No one else would be making those. Transdime is very good at that. Uh, and once you get into the ecosystem, Remember one thing. So when you are, uh, when a Boeing is designing that, Transdime kind of has an agreement that this is the price I'm going to sell my parts to you, okay? And the airlines actually can tell Boeing that, okay, I'm going to buy these things with five or 10 years of warranty. So within that warranty period, Boeing has to keep supplying those parts if they need a replacement. But beyond that five to 10 years, the airlines have to come to these suppliers to buy these parts, right? And if you think about it, this any of these, you know, these platforms, they can run for like very long, long time. So I think the Boeing 747 was retired a few years back. So it ran for probably more than 60 years. So think about that time frame between 10 to 60 years, right? So that is when the companies like Transdime, they display massive, massive pricing power because, because you're sole sourced, you do not, the airlines, they do not have many options to go to, right? And if you see like, you know, they typically get uh, an inflation plus pricing every year, that is for sure. And at the same time, if you think about it, aerospace as an industry globally has been growing at around five to 6%. If you just look at the um, kind of the miles flight, uh, total miles flight, like what is called revenue, uh, revenue passenger mile. So that is growing at four or five percent, and you get a decent pricing, and with that you get a decent operating leverage, right? So you get that eight to nine percent of core growth. That's what Transdime does, and on top of that, 
you basically deploy this money uh, in kind of very juicy return, you know, that in companies that can give you this very juicy return. So the IRRs that I kind of trans time targets are very high. It can be, it, you can see that in their share price as well. Now, what trans time did uh, very aggressively, I would say to some extent, uh, they understood the stability of this business model. And as a result, if you look at these numbers, uh, you know, they have basically the numbers capital allocation as a percentage of CFO. They have actually allocated almost three and a half X of the money they have made. So they basically levered up quite a bit. So they operate like a private equity player, right? Now that that kind of make you ask a question that, you know, if, if we get into a regime where the interest rate kind of you know stays very high then what would happen to this kind of companies the point being is transname actually survived two major uh, kind of global events number one was the was the time when uh, you know this twin tower uh, twin tower crash basically in 2000 early 2000 and then also the gfc and the number three was this covid which was unique to aerospace industry but despite this high leverage, Transdime could survive, not only survive, they actually, you know, propelled through that very nicely. In fact, I was very shocked in 2020 when they announced a dividend, uh, you know, middle of 2020. It was actually, you know, as a shareholder, I, I still am a shareholder, uh, but, you know, so they in kind of, you know, when everyone is saying that the aerospace industry is kind of over, et cetera, et cetera, Transdime comes in and they say that, you know, I'll give you extra special dividend. Now, that is the part of the business. They identified it, um, you know, when I compare that with Haiko, one of our other major holdings, we definitely find Haiko is that, you know, a little bit more nicer guy, I would say in that sense. They are not extract to extract too much pricing power on their customers. But at the same time, both these models operate pretty nicely. And if you look at any of those, I mean, Transdime, you can see the returns has been just phenomenal. I mean, this 25, 30% total share comp return compounding, very few can match that. In fact, um, I was telling to one of one of, the, one of my colleagues that, you know, you always look at Amazon. I mean, it has been a historically great compounder over the last 15, 20 years. But do you really know that, you know, Amazon and <laughs> their returns are actually very similar, even though not many people actually know Transdime. Everyone knows Amazon, right? So again, this is the power of uh, power of I, I would say capital allocation, power of taking a relatively lower growth but steady growth industry and kind of taking out maximize the juice out of that and benefit the shareholders. Great, great. Uh, since you're talking of Heiko, you know, uh, would you like to? Uh... Take yeah. High call, so yeah, it would be nice. Yeah, to see so um, high call is little different from Transdime. So as I told you that you know, uh, Transdime uh, gets in to a design, or they acquire a company that has designed something proprietary for Boeing or Airbus. What Haiku does is they understand the pain of the airlines, right? So airlines across the globe, they are most of the time they are bankrupt. You know, you hear about these stories that airfares are kind of going higher and higher but they barely translate into any profit for any airline across the globe. So what Haiku tries to, you know, what they try to do is uh, they make, they try to make the generic spare parts for, uh, for, uh, for the kind of components that need to be replaced, right? So think about it, if it's OEM, um, they, they're pricing their product at X, Haiku would get in and uh, they'll say that I'll make it at 30% discount, right? Now, can Haiko do that? Um, so Haiko has to definitely get an approval from FAA and uh, Haiko can only do it if there is a high volume kind of product that you can find. That is how we can actually unleash your uh, capability to do it lean, etc. You can take out a lot of cost because they're high volume. So typically, Haiko and Transdime, they don't overlap each other because Transdime is looking for this low volume, high margin kind of things. Haiko is trying to target this high volume stuff where they can actually help the airlines save cost. So as I say, like, you know, it is also a very fragmented market. Combined, uh, you know, Transdime and Haiko's market is 70, 80 billion market. Uh, these guys have very minimal market share. But again, they're they are addressing different things altogether. I've mentioned that they're nice guys. So basically Haiko 
keeps their operations very decentralized. They keep on acquiring companies throughout the years. They've acquired more than 80 companies and they let them run on their own. They just help them to scale up, right? So I, their returns are not as stellar as Transdime. So Transdime's total return, as you saw, like is 30% plus. High quotas, 18, 19%. They're happy with it. And as a shareholder, again, I'm a shareholder of this too, as part of GCP. Uh, we are also kind of looking for that kind of return going forward. Right, right. And I, I think it's very clear, nice guys don't finish last. Just, uh, yeah, that's, we think uh, the longevity of this model is actually much better than maybe some of the other guys that you're talking about here. Right. Uh, and I understand, you know, there's one more nice guy that uh, we own in, in GCP. Right? Uh, yeah. can, so, I'd love Jaibir, to know more about that too. Yeah, Jaibir is actually more closer to this story. Jaibir, why don't you go ahead? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, again, similar to Haiko, nice guys, but very, very different business. Uh, they also have a small aerospace defense business, but it's it's much more diversified than that. So this company goes back to the 1930s. Uh, the person who started it, he invented a particular component who, which uh, was a socket for vacuum tubes. Now, I'm pretty sure most people in on this call have never even seen a vacuum tube. So this company goes that far back. They got into uh, connectors for military aircraft uh, around World War II. Uh, they IPO'd in the 1950s. Then for about a 30 year period, they were owned by a different company. That company went into certain problems. This company listed again in the early 90s. The current operating model actually predates that. So what's unique about Amphenol is a few different things. So the first is they almost exclusively make low value, but very high criticality parts. So the most common example would be connectors. It, uh, any of us who has a, has a cell phone knows that if the charging port goes bad, the whole thing is bust. And that's again, a very low value part, but very high criticality. So the same kind of criticality can be found across a range of connectors across um, you know, whether it's aerospace, whether it's industrial, whether it's tech, whether it's telecom, and these guys do all of that. It, so that's the first thing. Everything is very critical, but nothing is high value. Second is everything is decentralized. And when I say everything, it's literally everything. This company has 130 business GMs. Each, each business GM basically run their own company. So effectively, this is a conglomerate of 130 companies. Uh, they have decentralized manufacturing. So literally any country in the world where their customers are there, they will have manufacturing. Basically means very high customer service levels, uh, very close connect with customers. That's the other sort of point of lock-in. And the third thing is, despite the criticality, despite the closeness to customers, they are never extractive in good times. So in good times, you won't see Amphenol taking up prices inordinately. You won't see any kind of adverse behavior, um, which you do notice in, in certain other suppliers. But the flip side of that is that they have some of the most stable margins I've ever seen. Because even in bad times, when volumes are down, they will go to their customer and say, look, this time we need pricing. And because it's a low value part, because these are such good long-term partners, they actually get it. Um, now, this has been, the, this has been built partly organically. Of course, the first part they made goes back 90 years. But this continuous addition of newer products, newer markets has been done through acquisitions. So there's, out of these 125, I think roughly 70 are acquisitions and over the last uh, 30 odd years. Um, they, are, they look for acquisitions in two ways. So the first is every business GM has a mandate that you need to know your competitors well. Uh, these competitors are typically small companies. They know them, uh, you know, they have good relationships with them. A lot of these uh, competitors eventually sell out to, to Amphenol when it comes uh, time for the owner to retire uh, because they're, again, friendly buyers. They'll keep the employees intact. They'll keep the brand name intact. 
Uh, the other is they have a very strong focus on TAM, very different from Constellation, I know, but they always uh, look for newer opportunities to add segments to uh, which they're currently not operating. So what you'll notice here is that in the last, uh, in the 2014 to 22 period, TAM grew at 7%. TAM grew at 7% because they entered the sensor segment. So they made a large acquisition, they entered sensors, and that added a new chunk to TAM. So this will happen only once every 15 years or so. But when it does happen, there's a step change in, in TAM. That is not, that decision is centralized. That is not done by a GM, that's not led by a GM, that is led by the CEO. And coming to CEOs, they've only had two over the last sort of 25 years, current gentlemen, uh, has been in the job since 2006. I uh, think he'll be there another few years. But there is this remarkable stability in in uh, in the senior management team, uh, and there is a remarkable amount of stability in the GM pool. So this entire approach of you know critical paths, high pricing path, but never extracting your pricing path, uh, of continuously adding. Uh, opportunities uh, to your addressable market, continuously adding businesses, has meant that even though their underlying market grows relatively slowly, these guys deliver about seven to eight percent of organic growth, 11% uh, of uh, overall growth, operating profits a little higher, cash flow per share a little higher still, but remarkably stable through time. So you look at a 10 year history, 20 year history, 30 year history, any rolling five year period, you'll find this exact operating model playing out. Now, when you have end markets which are as cyclical as these guys have, mm -hmm. uh, that is truly really remarkable. So this is extremely interesting. Uh, uh, but but Arindam Jaibir, what I'm you know, wondering is that you've seen examples where acquisitions have, I mean, all the examples, you know, these are all highly acquisitive companies. Uh, they are very clearly added, uh, uh, you know, a lot of value to shareholders. Uh, I mean, what other forms of capital location uh, are, you know, great examples that you know, we can talk about? So the other prominent example tends to be buybacks. Um, we've got a few examples in the portfolio where if you look at history, there's an extra sort of four points, five points of compounding, which, which comes through buybacks. So MSCI is uh, is an example of that. And if you look at this table, uh, you know, three year, five year, 10 year, there's a four percentage point difference between free cash flow and free cash flow per share. That is all buybacks. Um, you would see something similar in Apple. It's slow organic growth, but juiced up by buybacks. And stepping back, you know, the way MSCI does this is is also quite uh, uh, quite remarkable. See, MSCI, if you go back in history, uh, Capital International had a, a business of uh, of indices for non-US markets, uh, which was set up in the sixties. In the mid eighties, MS uh, Morgan Stanley partnered with them, created this entity called MSCI. 2007 is when that got spun out of Morgan Stanley, and 2009 is when Morgan Stanley fully sold out. So all the operating history that you see here is when of MSCI as an independent company. Now, MSCI uh, has a very strong business in indices. Now, index, index providers make money through, uh, uh, through allowing ETFs to run on top of them, through selling their data, uh, to selling the rights of the index, of using the index to other asset managers, to providing uh, uh, analytic services. Now, what MSCI has done differently from some of the other big index providers, because the other big index providers aren't really independent. So MSCI shows a much higher degree of, uh, or seems to exhibit a much higher degree of effort in creating new business lines. And where this really shows up is in ESG. So if you step back and think MSCI is very strong on international 
Again, they started there. They're as an extension of that, very strong on emerging markets. Again, natural because they were anywhere stronger in non-US. However, EST is an area where they had no such starting advantage. Yet they are the leaders there. And they're the leaders there not just in the indices that have been created, they're also the leading advisors to asset managers on ESG. Now, this entire business line, the fact that they managed to establish leadership there shows that lack of lethargy. And that lack of lethargy is what gives comfort that, that they can keep the machine going. Because the machine itself is, is quite powerful. It, asset, and they make money both from flows as well as MTM gains. And you layer operating leverage on top and there is always a healthy PBT or profit growth which, which comes through. And the extra kicker, which because this is a completely asset light business, because these are, and this is a management team which is very aware of the fact they don't actually have any use for capital. They're very judicious in returning it to shareholders. And that return to shareholders is what shows up here as a 4% extra compounding that you get just from the fact that this is a company which doesn't hold capital. All right. Uh, I mean, what I'm picking up is, you know, irrespective of the the nature of the business, the industry that uh, you operate in, there's always a solid room to create shareholder value through smart capital allocation. It, a business may not allow you certain pricing advantages, but uh, capital allocation really drives that. So, so these are fantastic examples, Arindam Jaibir. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, do you think we are ready to take some questions from the audience or is there something else that you would want to highlight before we do that? Uh, no, I'm just kind of reinforcing, you know, like uh, we focus a lot in GCP, especially uh, within the, you know, for capital allocation. I mean, that's a, a very key point when you're selecting any stock. And uh, to some extent, I mean, uh, we, we try to identify, go as much, go as, you know, as far as we can to find out that kind of opportunities. And uh, hopefully we, we can find a few more and put them in the portfolio. But yeah, happy to take questions. Sure, great. Already, uh, some of them are coming in. Uh, the you know, the first question is from uh, Divyan Shvarma, and uh, you know he says that shareholder returns, I mean, the returns to shareholders can come from uh, you know the dividends, share price appreciation, and uh, buybacks. But at uh, one level, all the three are dependent on free cash flow growth, right? Uh, if that is the case, you know, should the company take decisions on capital location? Or should all the money be returned to shareholders and you know, they can then take a decision on what to do with that? Yeah, I can take that. Um, so, I mean, it really depends, you know, like uh, what, what company that you're looking at. So, for example, if it is Danaher, uh, we are happy that actually they are, they're doing, you know, they're deploying the free cash flow in the way they want it to do instead of returning it to us because we probably cannot find a better way to reinvest those, right? And in fact, uh, you know, um, I would say, the good capital allocators, they, they tend to understand it better than an average investor to what to do with the excess cash that they are making. So for example, I have a company called Copart in our portfolio. It's basically the largest online marketplace for salvage car. So if you go back and uh, you know see their history of buybacks, you'd see that you know they do buy back when the stock price is much below you know, if there's a sudden dip, they just come in and do the buyback. So the point being here is that otherwise they tend to do all the time they're trying to invest organically, but but they are the, you know, they know their the intrinsic value of their business the best if they are good capital allocators. Now, I have seen companies like, for example, Japan is a great example. There are a lot of companies that that they basically don't do anything with their capital. You know, if that is the case, right? Instead of keeping them idly, sitting them, you know, leaving there in the balance sheet, it is always better to just close your eyes, uh, blindly return the cash to shareholders. So it is really, it, it really depends, you know, like you need to analyze that, what kind of company that I'm looking at and how good are the uh, capital allocation practices for that company, right? Right, right. Uh, thanks, Arindam. 
uh, you know, there are a couple of questions on, you know, once you know, if there are companies which are doing so many acquisitions, right? Is there a way you analyze these investments? Uh, uh, it's impossible to know, right? Which, uh, you know, which are, which of those 40,000 companies that let's say Constellation has a database of could be a good acquisition or not. So whenever an announcement is made, uh, you know, how do you factor that in your assessment of the future? Yeah, right. Uh, so for a case for in the case of Constellation, as you know, every week they are doing doing two acquisition on average, actually more than that probably. Yeah. Uh, yeah so it is to some extent. Uh, what do you know about the company? I mean, of course, the disclose like what they are buying. You cannot know the price that they are paying in many cases. Yeah. But uh, typically, what you what you try to do is like after say every year, we look at all the acquisitions that they have made. Made we have a kind of database for that. And uh, look through, you know, like uh, we, we so constellation conducts a AGM every year, right? So there they get questions around the same thing. Now there is a leap of faith; you cannot deny that, right? Yep. But uh, we typically what we try to do is like we try to see what kind of verticals that they are going into, and if there has been many other transactions in that vertical or not. So things like that we keep a check. Definitely, eventually, uh, you know, constellation. What we like about constellation. Is that they uh, they are not trying to, you know, kind of cook their numbers by any means. In the sense, their ROI that they report it is actually a traditional ROI. Mm -hmm. There is nothing adjusted for that, right? So if you look at again Trans Constellation, their share count has remained constant throughout last sixteen years. So typically, what you see in a company is doing ton of acquisitions, their share count tend to you know go down. By leaps and bounds. So basically, they're kind of diluting the existing shareholders. That is not the case with Constellation. They have kept that constant. The way they compensate their managers, right? So for example, Constellation has a strict policy that if you are earning a you know more than a certain amount, I think it is seventy-five thousand or more bonus, then you have to keep that in a escrow account, okay, for four years or so, three or four years. So that is a good enough time to understand that you know what you did four years back. Right. So when you have these puts and checks in place, that kind of uh, gives you some confidence that, you know, they will not do something radically stupid. I see. I see. Uh, another, you know, related question to this is also on uh, the risk profile right now. Uh, does it happen that in order to, uh, you know, keep the treadmill going, as you mentioned uh, earlier, uh, the risk profile of the newer investments increases, right? And an investor comes in with a certain risk return expectation. Uh, you know, when you analyze these, you know, do you, uh, how do you think of uh, these two elements? Yeah, uh, look, I mean, I the way I think about it is, uh, I think the amount of capital that they can deploy that would, I, I when I'm modeling it, uh, my algorithm is fairly simple, uh, that their organic revenue growth would be say four to 5%. If they can improve it, that is great. Uh, we don't kind of incorporate in our, as a best case. But uh, on top of that, they typically deploy, say, 20 to 25% ROIC. That is how they deploy the excess capital. So I assume that they'll probably be able to deploy 50 to 60% of that mm -hmm. if they are keeping their discipline unchanged. If they want to deploy, and in entirety, probably the return ratio will come down. So for example, we are not, I'm not baking in a return profile of more than 15%, with that 4% from organic and you know 50% of capital deployed uh, of what they're generating. So that takes me to 15%. So as long as that math is easy for me and I don't see any deviation from their ROIC, uh, and also we do a lot of channel checks with you know many of the X constellation you know, MNA directors and all, um, and to get an idea, you know, how the market is moving, etc. To our view, I mean, in our view, that that hasn't changed significantly. Constellation has still a long runway to go. Uh, is as I said, uh, you know, the total return is basically your organic growth plus ROIC into capital invested. That's the formula. So as long as that is hitting more than 15% and our channel checks are not signaling us, you know, any kind of, you know, aggress aggression in the marketplace or in, in any other way, we're probably good to go for now. And as I said, the our target is 15% KGAR. We're not looking 
you know, like 20, 25% what they have done historically. I see. All right. Uh, you know, I, I want to pick up uh, on one sentence you mentioned earlier. There are uh, some questions. And that is, uh, you mentioned the company, we are sure, is not cooking its books. Right now, uh, in one of Marcellus's books, uh, Diamonds in the Dust, you know, we've written that there's a thin line between, uh, you know, very smart capital like location or multiple acquisitions and fraud. Uh, so is there a way to figure out, you know, uh, say integrity or, uh, or uh, uh, you know, management intention in doing that? I mean, is track record enough or is there some way to get comfort on, on where we are putting money? Right. Uh, that's a great question. Uh, so the is the, you know, the source of truth, uh, in my view, when you're analyzing any of these companies, I mean, uh, of course, you have to do deeper dive doing the primary data research and all. But the most like from outside world, the best number to look at is your free cash flow. Mm. That is your ultimate source. You can, it is very hard to cook that number. You can, you can change the EBITDA numbers. You can change your return numbers. I mean, there are a ton of adjust, you know, adjustment that goes in. Free mm. cash flow number, that is what you cannot change. So if you're analyzing a company, is like taking a first look into it, that is number one. Number two is, of course, you know, uh, you talk to, you tend to talk to a lot of people who has, you know, the, the good thing about analyzing the businesses is that they have ton of BUs, right? So Constellation has more than 150 plus BUs probably. Uh, the companies we are talking about, many of them have like Amphenol has on 30. So you get quite a few ex-executives who have operated in many of these BUs, right? So what we try to do is we try to find a controller you know, who has taken care of this financial decision and we try to schedule multiple calls with them to understand what kind of practices has been undertaken by these guys, right? Um, and that is a second level of check that we can do, right? Uh, otherwise, I mean, as I said, free cash flow is a very hard number to, you know, it is not easy yeah. to cook that number. True, true, I agree. Uh, right, the you know, between buybacks and dividends, uh, as investors, should we, uh, you know, be indifferent to either or is there, say, more value from uh, one versus the other? So that, uh, it's a function of the taxation and that particular market. Um, in the U.S., um, buybacks are more tax efficient than, than dividends. That's why the market tends towards buybacks. Um, in India, there are a lot of restrictions around buybacks, hence companies do, do more, uh, more dividends. Uh, but fundamentally, as long as you're reinvesting the dividends, it, it comes to the same thing. Like whichever is the most tax, more tax efficient route, that's the, uh, and that depends on the market. Right. Thanks, JB. Uh, people, in case you have any questions, you can, uh, put them in the Q&A box, uh, for now, Arindam, uh, I think we don't have any more questions coming in. Uh, should we go through the portfolio? Uh, yeah, uh, so, yeah, absolutely. So mm -hmm. let's go through that. Um, so we have probably seen this. We just updated with the latest data and the profile has largely been unchanged. Um, again, uh, almost two to three X of, uh, you know, compounding compared to what the market offers. And um, yeah, this is the, end of July, right? Yeah, end of July uh, performance. That's how it looks like. Um, probably the one thing of interest is that um, despite our combined weightage on the FANG stocks per se of less than 10%, or probably 10 or 11%, we own uh, Apple, Microsoft, and Amazon within that bucket. Uh, this perform. I mean, you might have heard that you know these these are the seven stocks which is driving the entire S and P rally. We have still been able to you know uh, kind of hold up pretty well. In fact, that kind of shows you know like uh, the power of capital allocation. You know, which is probably more underappreciated, but uh, they tend to do the job probably as good as you know the flashy counterparts, uh, as long as you can choose them carefully. So yeah, again, not uh, not a long uh, track record, I would say, eight, nine months, but uh, this is how it looks like. Uh, 
Yeah. So yeah, that broadly yeah. concludes the prepared remarks. Yeah. Right. And uh, Arun, you know, there's a related question on portfolio performances. Uh, you know, some of the other companies which you discussed earlier, like ASML, uh, Hermes, how are uh, they performing? Uh, any any updates on on them? Um, so, yeah, Armis, I think, is one of the biggest, uh, the largest contributors since we launched it. I think year to date also it is up 25 or 30 percent. ASML is, I have to see, it is probably up 17, 18 percent. The uh, one thing I would like to mention is that since we opened it to the public, uh, or even since we launched actually towards uh, end of, since October, end of October, the churn has been around 6 percent. So, you know, mostly. Uh, it is the same portfolio uh, what we started with. So the performance that you see is kind of more or less equally. Uh, all the stocks have contributed uh, fairly equally, I'd say. There has been some detractors, but more or less it has been uh, fairly distributed. Right. 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 Thanks. Uh, thanks, Arindam. Uh, I think that largely concludes it. Uh, uh, that's most of the questions answered. Uh, there are some questions on the product. Uh, uh, in case, uh, uh, Ria, would you be able to answer some of these? Uh, yeah. Uh, so, so, Ria, there's a question on clarity on the tax of 5% on money that is sent overseas. Do we have uh, any incremental information yeah. on that? So yeah, so the 5% is the tax collected at source, which is the TCS. Uh, yes, of course, for all resident individual clients taking money abroad, whether investments or you go out for uh, a vacation, anything, up to 7 lakhs, there is no TCS. Beyond that, any money going abroad until 1st of October 2023, the TCS is at 5%. The government, unless and until there's a further, um, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, the deadline being increased until that the decision is from 1st of October 2023 the TCS ch changes to 20% from 5% I see all right uh, and other than to confirm uh, this is a multi-cap fund right or do you uh, focus on a certain uh, market cap uh, segments here uh, it is multi-cap. We try to focus on the liquidity. So as long as you have more than four to five million dollars of liquidity, uh, it's fine. So the minimum market cap that we have in a portfolio is around five billion, four or five billion USD. Right. Yeah. Great. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, so, uh, folks, thank you very much for attending. This is uh, it for for today evening. Thanks, uh, Jaybir Arindam. And uh, we'll hope uh, we'll see you in the next GCP webinar. Uh, Ria, do you want to uh, say something before we close on how clients can approach us? Uh, potential investors could uh, get in touch. Okay, I guess we've lost uh, Ria, but uh, in case you know anybody is interested, sales at marcellus.in is where you can get in touch. I'm sorry, I'm here. Uh -huh, sorry. That's anything you want to close before we uh, anyone to say before we close? Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, you know, as uh, last time also, uh, I had said clearly that now we can in uh, all uh, the investment open for, for NRI clients restriction with respect to certain NRI clients. As I said, please write to us. We will. We'll take your questions one-on-one, -on -one, your queries one-on-one, -on -one. happy to connect with uh, all of you one-on-one -on -one and take you through the portfolio and, of course, the, the other nitty-gritties of the portfolio. Uh, so, sorry, people. I think Ria is traveling. Uh, so, thank you. And, um, uh, and Salil. Right. So, sorry about that. I think Ria is uh, traveling, so we lost her a, a couple of times. But uh, the point is, you can write into us at sales at marcellus.time and we will respond to uh, each of your uh, queries, questions, and uh, uh, give you necessary details on this. Uh, thank you again. Uh, thanks, Sarindam. Thanks, Jabir. Uh, all of you have a very good evening. Bye bye. Thank you. Thanks, Sarindam.